Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Frankly Speaking Baseball, right here on WWBG 1470 AM, WTOB 980 AM, and 96.7 FM, as well as TobaccoRoadSportsRadio.com. We're also streaming on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and are on many, many podcast platforms such as Spotify. You know, we talked the first segment about some hot, hot teams in baseball. It can't be a hotter team between the two guests that we have today. Later on, we'll have Bill Lasky of the San Francisco Giants. And now we have the honor of being joined by Cincinnati Reds TV analyst for 29 years. That's right, 29 years, currently at Valley Sports. Let's welcome in Chris Walsh. Chris, how you doing, buddy? I'm very well, Larry. Thank you for having me today. I'm kind of excited about talking to you. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, you got to also be excited about talking about uh, the Cincinnati Reds, who are off to an unbelievable, unbelievable season, Chris. Uh, you know, it was August 15th. I went to Great American Ballpark this year. Team was 6-8. and eight. I think they were playing the Phillies, if I remember, a couple of months back. Will Myers hit two home runs, and I'm watching the game. And this is the team 62-100 and 100 last year. And all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, this team has a lot of young players on it. And I wanted to ask you, last year, as I mentioned, 62 and 100, what do you attribute to this year's turnaround? Well, I think the natural progression towards the median is one thing, because they have better players, I think, than their record showed last year. They went through a terrible start to the season. I think there were something like three wins against 22 losses at one point last year, so or, or in that neighborhood. So it, it got to be dismal. The attitude of the players was down. Uh, the attitude of the front office was, you know, we just got rid of a bunch of veteran players. We're trying to rebuild. We don't really expect very much. So there really, really was no talk or incentive for winning at all. And this year, the culture coming out of spring training was completely different. They talked about winning. They talked about competing. They talked about taking a step forward as a team rather than rebuilding individuals, and I think that's the biggest difference. You know, when you look at this team, uh, um, Chris, you look at it, and it's amazing. I mentioned how young this team is. Actually, in the starting lineup, the starting nine, the only person over age 30 is Joey Votto, who just came back. And then on the starting pitching staff, Ben Lively, who I think is uh, injured right now, is the only pitcher over 30. Talk about David Bell and his, you know, obviously the handling of young players. There's a lot of managers that have a lot of difficulty, don't want to play the young players. They want to go to veteran players. But David Bell is really doing a good job handling a lot of young players. You know, most managers don't get a chance to shape their team the way they'd like to, as far as setting down some team rules, some policies, some procedures, you know, what things you're supposed to do throughout the entire year as far as practice and and so on, because veterans are coming in from other teams and they're used to doing their own thing. And you don't want to get in the way of a big agent, free agent that you sign and try to upset the apple cart, so to say. So, but in this case, David Bell has had a chance to kind of pre-think that. And really from spring training on, he has tried to mold this clubhouse into a, a winning culture, into a good chemistry clubhouse. They've got a, a number of good players, but even more important than that they've got all really good young men who really want to play hard and they want to play for the greater benefit, which is wins for the team rather than individual accolades. And I think that's the biggest thing. He brought in a number of featured speakers uh, this spring, you know, guys who are like Navy SEALs and who are mental strength coaches, um, all sorts of guys like that, uh, or not guys, but speakers like that, that uh, were able to kind of, get the message across to these players, you know, how fortunate they are to be playing baseball and what they can do to excel in a very difficult sport. And uh, I think that kind of approach has really helped. Uh, he's been hands-on all year long, and I think a lot of the credit goes to David Bell for that. Yeah, let's talk about a couple of the young players. Uh, Tuesday night, Andrew Abbott, unbelievable, unbelievable again. I think in his last 23.2 innings, he's given up like 14 or 16 hits. He's 4-0, and oh, um, and he's just been lights out. I think he's given up one run during that time. <laughs> At a time when Cincinnati really could have used some help with the starting uh, pitching, he's definitely been one heck of a guy to step in. 
Well, they certainly could use some help. There's no question about that. And they thought they made a pretty good draft back in 2021 when they when they picked Abbott in the second round out of the University of Virginia. You know, he's a smart kid, number one. Uh, he is a bulldog. He is the kind of kid that is just really tough. You know, he just is used to winning. He uh, he had a tremendous stint. He had double A to start the season. Then he went to triple A. Um, after that, and he continued to dominate there. So the Reds had no choice to call him up. They needed pitching. He was majorly ready. He throws strikes with his breaking pitch, and he's got a very explosive fastball. Even though the fastball only runs up there at you know 93 to 94 miles an hour, which is right around major league average, uh, it still has extra life on it the way it comes out of his hand. He has a little bit of a delivery where he hides the baseball very well. So you can watch hitters take pitches when Andrew Habit pitches uh, a game, and you can tell that they don't see the ball very well because you're just not reacting to pitches that are right down the middle. So uh, Abbott has been just a godsend because the, the three pitchers the Reds had hoped to get at the beginning of the year, uh, Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo and, and Graham Ashcraft, have all at one time or another been injured. In fact, two of those are on the injured list right now. So Abbott was needed. He stepped in, and boy, he's off to one of the best starts in the history of baseball. What does the name L.A. De La Cruz means to the city of Cincinnati and the Cincinnati Reds? It means the Reds have a chance, finally. You know, it's amazing how one player can make such a huge difference. And in Cincinnati, they talk about Joe Burrow, the Bengals, making such a big difference. Now, he's got a nice core of receivers. They've improved a lot of their different aspects of their game, the Bengals have. But it's Joe Burrow that made everything possible. You know, a, a superstar caliber player can uplift everybody around him. And that's what Ellie De La Cruz has done. Even though he hasn't, he's only shown flashes of superstardom, but you can see it's there. I mean, it didn't take him long to hit his first home run. It didn't take him very long to, to do something that hasn't been done in Cincinnati since 1989. That was hit for the cycle. He's hit opposite field home runs. He's gone from first to third as fast as anybody in baseball. Uh, he is the most exciting player in baseball, and uh, and the Reds have him, and I think that's the biggest thing of all, and that's what excites the fans. You know, you look at this team one through nine, and I'll tell you what, they are incredible. They really are, and they're fun to watch. But the one thing I love about this team, Chris, and I go back to the old days, and I know a lot of us, sometimes us guys, we say the old days, but what I'm talking about is they're playing baseball the way baseball should be played. They're not just hitting the homers, although they got some guys that have the ability to, but this team is doing it because they're getting on base. They're fourth in the league on base percentage, eighth in runs. They're showing people how the game of baseball should be played. Yeah, and they're also second in stolen bases behind the Tampa Bay Rays. So That's right. That makes you think about it. And they're one place ahead of the Arizona Diamondbacks. So think about that for a second, Larry. That, you know, the, the stolen base has gone so out of vogue over the last few years with hitters trying to hit home runs and batting coaches trying to, you know, lift and separate with their swings, with their swing slots and so on. And so what's happened is the pitchers have just run up the ladder and thrown high fastballs and gotten those hitters out swinging and missing. The Reds have really made a major change in their approach at the plate. They were like every other team two or three years ago, trying to hit home runs. Now they're trying to put the ball in play. They're trying to hit the ball with two strikes uh, they're taking a lot of walks that they didn't do the last few years. Uh, and the stolen base, which got off to a little bit of a slow start for the Reds, has been huge because it's kept them out of double play balls. It's put fast runners in the scoring position. Overall, they've got a very fast team. They probably have got four players in that lineup that are capable of, of stealing 15 bases a year. And then you've got a couple of them in there that are capable of stealing 30 or more. So, uh, that's what's made it exciting, and that's what they've kind of done and under the radar. If you look at some of the other things about the Reds, for instance, if you really want to dig into the stats and start thinking about you know, exit velocity, where do the Reds rank and hitting the ball hard? Well, they're like 29th in all of baseball, but they're up there in batting average. So you could say in a way that they're hitting it where they ain't. They're also lucky a little bit in getting some balls to fall in there. But they never give up. And the number of comeback wins that they have, I think, is tops in the league. You know, I had to ask you this. You mentioned stolen bases. And, you know, you being a former pitcher in the major leagues for the Reds and a couple other teams, 
Talk about how you, you personally, like or dislike the pitch clock and the rule of you can only go over to first base two times. Well, I, I always thought the pitch clock was going to be good. I just knew that Major League Baseball needed a fundamental change in the pace of the game. Last year, there were four minutes between balls being put into play in a Major League Baseball game. This year, it's less than two minutes. So they've cut in half the amount of time a fan has to wait until they see some play. That's the biggest thing for me. The games are tidier. I don't see any major change in the way players play the game, and I love the pitch clock. The, uh, the step-off rule, too, is I was very skeptical about that. I thought that there would be rampant base running. Uh, there, there would be you know guys out there that were just running at will, and there's nothing you could do about it. But uh, I've been proved completely wrong on that, that it hasn't really changed a little bit. It's, it's clicked up the, att- uh, the attempts for stolen bases a little bit, but it hasn't changed the, the way the game's played. So um, I think it's just wonderful. But all the rules, I think, so far are fine. I'm still not sold on that on the no shift rule, um, but only because it really hasn't changed the behavior of batters that are trying to hit home runs. Think about it for a second. Is that when you when you don't have a shift and you're a left-handed hitter and you're slow run to first base and you so you try to hit home runs, right? Well the penalty for not hitting a home run sometimes is hitting a ground ball. And with no shift, um, that ball goes in there. So what you're doing is you're not trying to change the behavior of baseball hitters, left-handed hitters especially, uh, because there's no penalty now for not hitting a home run. So I'm not sure that that has had the, um, uh, you know, the reward what Major League Baseball thought, but they wanted to put more offense in the game. The, the, you know, the guys that are making the decision at MLB, uh, and I think so far it's happened. You know, a couple more questions. We'll let you run, Chris. Talk about, I want to talk about two plays specifically um talk about the importance not just from a production standpoint of go getting joey Votto back but on a young team where they have a lot of young guys as we mentioned earlier the leadership that he brings to the team and then talk about the unbelievable closer um alexis diaz who has 21 saves and this the rest of this bullpen that has just been lights out well first on Votto, you know when you get Votto. He had a major arm injury and surgery last year. He had uh, biceps tendon and rotator cuff surgery on the same arm at the same time. So that's like having two surgeries. And uh, so that was back, I think, in August last year. And recovery time is usually about a year on that. But Bono was able to come back before that. Um, And he, every team at the trade deadline, Larry wants to add a veteran bat and they want to add some pitching. Well, the Reds got the veteran bathroom inside there by getting Votto back. He's been very good. You know, no matter how your skills diminish towards the end of your career, as you get older, you know, your eyesight doesn't get any better. Your reaction doesn't get better. Your foot speed doesn't get better. Votto is still one of the premier hitters of his generation. And he's going to get on base. There's no question about that. So the only question is, does he have some power? And I think he's dispelled any, any doubters because he's already hit some powerful home runs. Um, so getting him back has been a settling thing for the clubhouse. It's also helped the lineup considerably. Uh, he's not a rah-rah guy, but he's a very solid player who's been around a long time, and he knows how MLB works. And I think on a young team, you need at least one player like that. Uh, as far as the other one, I'm not, I am not. forget what uh, the other question was. The bullpen uh, and Alexis Diaz. Yeah, uh, you know, a bullpen – when you evaluate a bullpen, it's funny because when broadcasters get together, you know, we want to talk about the other team. We want some stories that are on the inside that you can't find on the Internet and so on. Uh, but so when we evaluate each other's bullpens, we always start at the back end first. I mean, who's your closer? Who's your setup guy? Who's your go-to left-handed reliever and so on? And it's really fun to talk about Alexis Diaz because here's a guy that came out of nowhere. Uh, I mean, they took the guy off the roster uh, a few years ago. They put him back on. He comes into spring training. Uh, it's going to be a battle between him and a few other pitchers for the closer spot last year when basically it was uh, closed by committee. And he just stepped forward and just threw the ball extremely well. They noticed one thing about Diaz that they didn't notice about some of the other pitchers. And that was his incredible spin rate. I don't want to get too technical, but 
basically his fastball has exceptional spin, which means it doesn't sink. They call that movement nowadays. And his, his slider is one of the top in baseball in spin, which means it's going to break more. So when he's able to combine that and actually put the ball near the strike zone, he's almost unhittable. I mean, his strikeout rates are off the charts. They're up there around the Rollers Chapman territory. So he's been really good. The next step of that is finding some guys who can be set up, man, and they've really been able to, to, to bring along guys like Buck Farmer, another player. They released him last May. They signed him to a minor league deal, and here he is, the go-to guy for the Reds in the eighth inning. Uh, Lucas Sims came back off the injured list. He's been very good. Uh, the only left-hander they have, Alex Young, uh, has been called on time and time again. And he's been excellent. So <clears throat> little by little, the bullpen has basically helped this ball club to where they are right now because where they were last year and the year before with bullpen is they were losing a ton of games late in the game and that just kills your attitude i mean it just kills the spirit of the ball club and that hasn't happened this year well listen my friend i, I could talk to you all day about the exciting cincinnati reds but we're running out of time here i want to thank you very very much taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on frankly speaking baseball thank you for having me larry Look forward to talking to you next time. All right, my friend. Stay safe. You got it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was the great Chris Welch, Cincinnati Reds TV analyst for over 29 years. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll have the great Bill Lasky of the San Francisco Giants.